Are you guys in there? Hey, here's a hint. They're at McDonald's in the $1.99 Sonic 3 Hamburger Happy Meal. Sonic launches with a push of a button. Hey, guy, you're the first serious gamer I've seen all morning. Check this out. Brand new 16-bit Super Nintendo with Super Mario World. Wow! Oh, what's this one? Oh, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog from Sega Genesis. Hey, look at these radical colors, huh? Wow, Sonic's fast, too. No. Make for a very exciting spring. But first, the boys... Hey, you. Yeah, you in the sweater. Save yourself from the grips of old age huh? and boredom. <laughs> Step away from the table and put the shovel down. Pop the hood. The hood. Clearly, times have changed. Video game ads of old create a stark contrast with today. Back when game consoles got associated with mascots and fun colors, it seems they had it easy. Nowadays, games don't only cater to children, but they insert themselves into a broader spectrum of our lives, telling touching stories and providing memorable experiences to the likes of modern cinema, making it a major venue for today's mature entertainment. Welcome to The Rage Point, a video series going in-depth on gaming topics. This episode has been empowered by music from White Bat Audio. Links to Carl Casey's Bandcamp and music can be found in the comment section below. Today's in-depth topic, cloud gaming, when it started, where it's going, and who is really ahead of the curve. We will see what sets these available game streaming services apart by answering important questions like, what does cloud gaming mean for the average gamer? What is PlayStation Now compared to Xbox Game Pass? What does Microsoft Cloud Gaming have that Amazon Luna doesn't? And finally, why Google Stadia is so misunderstood? We'll be answering these questions and more in a non-biased and non-destructive manner. There are fairly straightforward answers to all these questions, but it seems a lot of people's minds are clouded by one gaming service or another. Pun intended. Furthermore, we'll take a closer look at what came before, the trials and tribulations of other gaming platforms, and the way they made progress to video game streaming technologies in an effort to gain a footing in the new future industry of game streaming services, now largely known as cloud gaming. We'll take a detailed look at the impact these technologies will have moving forward. Before we move ahead and delve deeper into today's topic, I'd like to take the time to assure you that if you happen to like this video, it will support the channel immensely. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to smash that subscribe button and ring that bell so you can stay up to date on our latest videos, live streams, and YouTube shorts. With all that said, let's dive straight in, shall we? What you need to understand first and foremost is that the gaming services that currently exist are not all the same and it is quite hard to compare at a first glance mainly due to their particular subscription models, but we'll get into that later in the video. Obviously, not all services provide the same type of content and or restrictions. Take PlayStation Network, for example. The current and next generation console users have been paying Sony Computer Entertainment for the ability to play online on their freshly purchased multiplayer games. For years now, consumers have done this without batting an eye. This rang true for the PlayStation Network at least until free-to-play became such a huge deal and demanded a free basis to play online without an entry fee to begin with. And yet Microsoft Xbox Live Gold actually kept the necessity to have a subscription to their service in order to play free-to-play games on their Xbox platforms. Until January 2021, that is, when the paywall had to be dropped due to public outcry. That's when Microsoft entered a royal shitstorm by raising the price on Xbox Live Gold to push their Game Pass subscription onto consumers. People reacted in an uproar over the fact that it's unethical to re-raise the price on something they shouldn't be paying for in the first place. Think about all the kids that have an Xbox console that had to purchase Xbox Live Gold to be able to play their free-to-play games like, for instance, the uber-popular Fortnite. I am solely mentioning Xbox here, as this was not an issue for the PlayStation Network users. PlayStation Network users didn't have to pay for the PlayStation Plus service to play their free-to-play games. However, Sony did have its fair share of problems when it came to cross-playability with online games that they aren't even hosting on their PlayStation Network service to begin with. 
Now, with those old online gaming subscription services out of the way, we can have a closer look at the cloud gaming or game streaming services on the video game market right now. But let's start with things that are more directly comparable to a console experience. Mind you, there were plenty of other game streaming services out there even before PlayStation Now, Xbox Cloud Gaming, Stadia, GeForce Now, or Amazon Luna. Not all of them acted as a platform per se. Some, like the now bankrupt Shadow Cloud Computing, marketed towards allowing you to stream your PC games and applications to other devices. Let's start by taking a look at the troubled history of cloud gaming. On Live Arguably well ahead of its time, OnLive boasted the very first video game streaming service. With its reveal at GDC 2009, it featured video encoding tech that allowed the platform to broadcast high-quality game footage of the games being run on the powerful servers and receive players' input server-side simultaneously with an average 5 megabit per second connection. Soon after its reveal, OnLive started trending on Twitter and other social media outlets with a lot of people embracing the idea and skeptics alike, with questions like, can it run crisis? Being answered firmly and shown off to the crowds, OnLive gained popularity and yet there was a looming problem down the line. One year after its reveal, gamers had the opportunity to test out OnLive in a closed beta form in early 2010, streaming the online service straight to their computer with the OnLive app. Later, it would be revealed in a detailed article by Sean Hollister for The Verge that over 100,000 people participated in this beta, which in turn allowed OnLive to gain traction with developers and publishers to get their games on the new gaming platform. And yet, there was a mixed reception to the beta. The user base was divided. It seems there was a structural problem, something that was mostly out of OnLive's control. Even though OnLive was hosted in five major data centers, the internet infrastructure back then for the United States and worldwide, even for that matter, wasn't half as reliable as it is nowadays. This in turn forced the servers to output a 720p resolution, which in actuality is not even considered an HD-ready resolution. With consoles back then giving similar resolutions for high-performance games, OnLive was fighting an uphill battle with well-established brands and products. This very issue caused OnLive to fall into obscurity soon after its launch in the summer of 2010. For the United States, the launch was attached to a steep subscription price of 14.95 US dollars. One year later, in September of 2011, the OnLive service would launch in the United Kingdom with a partnership to British Telecom, bundling it into their broadband packages, causing OnLive to cater to a very niche audience that had to have a stable connection by living near a data center, or else the connection was dodgy at best with a less than acceptable latency. It wasn't long before downsizing was initiated and layoffs commenced only a year after the international launch in the summer of 2012. The company would change hands multiple times in the years leading up to its final sale to Sony Computer Entertainment and it would get shut down right after. It is believed much of the assets and technology made their way into Sony's own gaming streaming service, PlayStation Now. But OnLive wasn't the only service or technology Sony would invest in and buy up. Sony's PlayStation Now is the longest-running video game streaming service to date. This is mostly due to Sony's acquisition of Gaikai, the service that allowed them to perfect a remote play for the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita systems. Gaikai Gaikai, which translates to Open Seas from Japanese, was actually founded in 2008, a full year before OnLive was even a thing in the public eye. Gaikai was already making strides in the field of streaming technologies and did not demo their technology to the public until GDC 2010, where they would show all sorts of games and software running in browsers. Gaikai did not require the user to access any kind of portal or sign up and download a dedicated application for it to work. Their services were embedded and deployed onto gaming-related websites, microsites, and even social media sites like Facebook. Gaikai's proprietary tech was running inside browsers built upon existing plugins such as Java and Adobe Flash. Some consumer electronics like TVs and handheld devices acquired the technology too. Gaikai was launched on February 27th of 2011 and made available to collaborating companies in two models, either through an ad network 
or open platform. The former was a service model where the user was presented with a streamable game demo, after which the user would be presented with a link to purchase the product online, or they were given the location to a brick and mortar store where they could make their purchase. Examples of YouTube links to streamable game demos of full PC games or integrations into EA Origins and Ubisoft's UbiShop come to mind for the year 2011. The latter half of the service was aimed at full game streaming to PCs, digital TVs and handheld devices. Companies like Samsung and LG would announce that they would provide TV users with the ability to stream AAA games to their product. This major league Gaikai technology was largely funded by many venture companies like Intel Capital and Qualcomm up until the services were bought by Sony on the 2nd of July 2012 for 380 million US dollars. It wasn't long before Gaikai was boasting their services with top-tier PlayStation titles ranging from The Last of Us to God of War and Little Big Planet. And yet behind the scenes there were various changes to the Gaikai infrastructure in order for it to support the ability to stream PlayStation 3 games to Sony devices. Due to the architectural complexity of the cell broadband engine processors that was prevalent in the PlayStation 3 systems at the time, Gaikai needed to adapt their service. Gaikai would end up having to build a motherboard equivalent of up to 8 PlayStation 3s interconnected into a server rack to allow the games to function while being broadcasted to the end user. The technology provided by Gaikai would pave the way forward for Sony's own streaming service as part of PlayStation Network called PlayStation Now. But before we can talk about PlayStation Now, we would benefit from taking a look at PlayStation Plus and how it came to exist within the PlayStation Network. PlayStation Plus it is no secret that before the PlayStation 4's launch, the PlayStation Network was the underdog of the console multiplayer landscape. The PlayStation Network service would see the light of the day on the Sony PlayStation 2 platform as a hardware add-on with the PlayStation Network adapter. This in turn would boost the popularity of games such as the now-defunct Zipper Interactive SOCOM series. However, it would take a while before the PlayStation Network we know and love from today would match the standards set by the fierce competition. During the lifetime of the PlayStation 3, the PlayStation Network remained a free network service, enabling players to join multiplayer matchmaking and befriend people online through the PlayStation Network friends list. However, the service itself would prove far more cumbersome than its counterpart Xbox Live Gold provided by Microsoft for their own Xbox consoles, and the latter, far more popular Xbox 360 console would surpass the PlayStation 3 as an online console with additional innovations like achievements for video game completionists who could set out to gain 1000 gamer score for fully completing a particular video game. The issues that plagued the PlayStation 3 were mainly due to the cross-media bar interface on the PlayStation 3 not allowing for a seamless transition from system menus to the actual video game and back nor did it have a way of letting friends communicate through an overarching voice chat other than what the game developers themselves provided for their multiplayer games. Not to mention how any form of player progression system, like a gamer's score, was missing from their console. The ability to access the cross-media bar and have an ongoing voice chat in between games would later be added in through a stable system update on July 8, 2008, with system software versions 2.41, as the prior 2.40 update caused all sorts of issues for the PlayStation 3 user base. The addition of this system software update also introduced the trophy system as the equivalent of Xbox console's gamer score, where players wouldn't just gain an arbitrary number, but would actually gain experience through earning trophies to level up their PlayStation ID rank. During the same time, Sony would provide US PlayStation 3 users a subscription-based online video magazine service called Core, created by Future Publishing. This video-on-demand content format would feature articles and videos of PlayStation titles with sneak peeks of upcoming games and interviews with game developers. Added to Core's package would be a monthly serving of video game downloads that couldn't be acquired anywhere else featuring PlayStation 1 classics, PlayStation minis, or even full PlayStation 3 games and even beta invites to the likes of SOCOM Confrontation. This particular service would amass criticism from the PlayStation community over intrusive adverts being played in between the very slim video content that was on offer. Not to mention the division between the user base as some gained access to exclusive content and others did not causing people to speculate whether this was a way for Sony to turn their online multiplayer platform into a paid service like that of Microsoft Xbox Live Gold. Four years after its launch, the service would be halted in the month of April 2012. In a certain sense, the core video on demand service would make way for a new service, the one currently known as PlayStation Plus, which would make its introduction together with the PlayStation 4's release. So what is PlayStation Plus, you ask? It's a paid service with a monthly, quarterly, or yearly subscription, providing you with the ability to 
to play your favorite games online with friends, getting early access to upcoming games, access to exclusive discounts on the PlayStation Store, and lastly, a monthly rotation of games you can add to your PlayStation Plus library for free as part of your subscription. The latter of these benefits remains yours to play for as long as you choose to keep your PlayStation Plus subscription running, meaning whenever you stop your subscription to PlayStation Plus, you lose access to this collection of games, provided you hadn't purchased the particular game prior to them being featured as part of PlayStation Plus. PlayStation Now PlayStation Now came into the picture shortly after the launch of the PlayStation 4 on January 28, 2014 for the United States of America, only later followed by the UK, EU and Japan years apart. For some, this service came as an answer to the initial drought of games on the PlayStation 4 system, circumventing the lack of original PlayStation 4 games by reintroducing games from the older generation consoles via the ability to stream them. This seemed ideal for those players who had only been on the Xbox camp before purchasing the PlayStation 4 with the promise of DRM-free gaming that was the hot topic during E3 2013. With the combined power and knowledge that came from the acquisition of OnLive and Gaikai, Sony had a fairly stable system for allowing people to stream games. But there was a catch. The launch was botched by having the service work as a digital blockbuster, allowing you to rent PlayStation 3 titles only at first. This would soon be followed up by a subscription model due to outcry by the player base and journalists alike. And yet the subscription model wasn't winning anyone over, with the ridiculous asking price of 20 US dollars a month totaling at 240 US dollars a year. PlayStation Now had just launched and it already seemed doomed to fail. Initially, the PlayStation Now service was available for the PlayStation 4 and later expanded to PlayStation 3, PlayStation TV and PlayStation Vita systems to stream games directly to the devices making the latter one of the very first handhelds capable of playing AAA video games from a server, only preceded by the PSP being able to stream games from your own PlayStation 3 via remote play. And now Sony's latest handheld was able to pull in AAA games at 720p from PlayStation Now. However, with Sony at the helm of this revolutionary technology and the need to push video game consoles with every new generation, the service quickly became sidelined. Support for the PlayStation 3, PlayStation TV and PlayStation Vita died on the summer of 2017, narrowing the availability of the service to PlayStation 4s and Windows PCs only. Just a couple of years after that, Sony would continue to drop the support for the older operating system with Windows 7 and Windows 8. And soon, it was clear that PlayStation Now was not what the gamers would dream to be the ultimate backwards compatibility service for the PlayStation games they knew and loved. After all, Sony Interactive Entertainment was a hardware manufacturing business first and a software company second. Perhaps the initial decision by Sony to purchase these precursors of the cloud gaming landscape was only to eliminate the very obvious threat to physical console sales. Not to mention how the PlayStation Now service has remained dormant for the longest time. The service saw minor improvements over a long period of time, such as newer games added to the library and its first major price reduction in September of 2019, dropping its monthly price to 10 US dollars. Only recently, PlayStation has shown a recurring interest in their streaming service with detailing of certain games getting 1080p full HD streaming support on PlayStation Now. And it was just last year Sony dropped their yearly PlayStation Now offer to a mere 60 US dollars per year, bringing it down to just $5 a month perhaps as a response to the rise in popularity of other streaming services such as Google Stadia, GeForce Now, and Amazon Luna, which just started out in the US. But there was yet another sleeping giant awakening coming back with a vengeance. Xbox Game Pass and Games with Gold Let's be honest, it's undeniable that Microsoft messed up with the announcement made during E3 press conference of 2013, followed by the initial launch of the Xbox One on November 2013. The Xbox One was X-boned as it were. With the idea of becoming the water cooler of your living room, the all-in-one box to provide you with television, gaming, and satellite radio for that matter. The kicker of it all was the always online DRM that would divide the Xbox fanbase and make most, if not all, players jump ship and pursue their gaming habits on the Sony PlayStation 4. If it was not due to one player's choice to change platforms, it was certainly due to their friends jumping ship and not wanting to be abandoned and them following following suit. Microsoft quickly realized they had to make 180 on their business decisions to win back their fan base they had amassed over the course of the Xbox 360's lifespan. The first step was to put Phil Spencer on the helm of Microsoft Xbox as early as March 2014. 
This magnificent man and his team would soon manage to stir up the gaming landscape by announcing their new approach and way forward for their gaming platform, promising innovation, free games with Xbox Live Gold in the veins of PlayStation Plus, and most of all, stability for multiplayer. This shift in strategy would prove to come at the right time, as PlayStation Network was experiencing the worst outages they had ever faced, due to the now notorious Lizard Squad that instigated DDoS attacks over the summer of 2014. Further manifesting the new approaches by Phil Spencer and his team to the Xbox ecosystem were the revisions of the Xbox One gaming console. A more affordable S version and a more powerful but pricey X version would see the light of day, making the Xbox One X the strongest half-step console of the 8th console generation. Following up on the move a year prior by Sony with the PlayStation Pro that came out to keep up with the ever-evolving PC gaming landscape, pushing graphics and gameplay to the next level. But the thing that little to no one saw coming was the soon-to-be revolutionary video game service Xbox Game Pass. Seeing the light of day in the summer of 2017, providing Xbox gamers with a plethora of monthly video games in the same veins as a Netflix provides TV shows, the new Xbox service would take off over the coming years as more games managed to be featured on the platform. These games would rotate in and out, providing players with very decent discounts if they would so choose to keep particular games. Moreover, Xbox gamers could opt for Game Pass Ultimate, which included Xbox Live Gold. Players were slowly but surely bringing Xbox back into their lives, whether it was with the cheaper Xbox One S and the Game Pass subscription to boot, or the Xbox One X that would overpower their base PlayStation 4 without sounding like it was trying to reach for the stratosphere with its fan noise, unlike the PlayStation 4 Pro. Alright, that's gonna do it for today's video. Don't forget to set that like button ablaze and smash the hell out of that subscribe button for more.